We are awakening together. This is our weekly gathering we hold online. For more information, visit our website, awakening-together.org. We'd love to see you there. Again, it's good to see you all this morning. I'm very happy that you are here today. <laughs> um, uh, what I would like to do is share the statement of purpose for today's weekly gathering. This statement of purpose comes from our fifth core value. We accept all forms as temporary appearances permitted through enduring awareness of self. We live this value by honoring all appearances and all experiences while continually reflecting on changeless truth. So before we get into the devotional part of our service, I'd like to share today's announcements. The first announcement that I have to share is that we do have another retreat this year, the end of teen, and that is the Freedom from the Ego Retreat. That retreat begins on December 9th and runs through December 13th. We do have four people registered for that retreat already, so it's a definite go, in case you were wondering. Uh, it's a definite go. To the degree that we are unaware of the ego, we're actually a slave to the ego. We believe those thoughts without even knowing that we're believing them, especially since they speak into our minds as us. So the purpose of this retreat is to become more aware of those unconscious thoughts and really their unconscious decisions to believe thoughts the unconscious decision that we make to believe thoughts um, that keeps us a slave to the ego to become more aware of that and in fact what i hope that you'll discover at the retreat is the word unconscious isn't even true it's not that, that we believe these thoughts unconsciously it's that we believe them quickly and fail to notice what we did uh, but it actually happens in consciousness. So we want to bring all of this decision-making in consciousness so we can see what we're doing uh, and then change our minds about it. Literally start making different decisions after we leave the retreat so that we're no longer a slave to the ego. Uh, this retreat will not be offered in 2020. So this is the last opportunity in the near future to catch this retreat. Again, it will be at the retreat house in La Vida, December 9 to 13. And of course, you can register by going to our retreats and classes menu and then looking under the retreats submenu. Uh, also, I just want to say that our 2020 retreats are open for registration. You'll also find all of them on our retreats menu, uh, retreats and classes menu underneath the retreats submenu. There are 17 retreats in 2020. Uh, most of which are repeated, you know, like each retreat is offered a couple of times, but there are certainly lots of retreats to choose from, lots of times of year to choose from. Uh, the fall retreat is still in the planning phase, so you'll notice the dates are mentioned, but no specific plans for the fall retreat. We are planning to have, as usual, two retreats, and you'll be able to sign up for one or both. The first retreat will be a retreat at the retreat house, but that retreat hasn't been defined yet. We don't know what that will be. The second retreat is going to be a pilgrimage, beginning at the retreat house and ending at the retreat house and going to holy sites in Northern New Mexico. And I'm in the process of planning that now. So you can expect a wonderful fall retreat and all of those details should be added by January, February at the latest as we finalize those plans. So go have a peek at our 2020 retreats and see which ones may interest you. As I mentioned, registration is now open. Um, uh, my final announcement today is uh, right after the weekly gathering today, we are having a memorial service. The memorial service is for Reverend Hal Seeley. He was our chairman of the board. Uh, he's also the one who graciously led the building of the ladies dorm. You know, when we bought the retreat house, that was just one big room. It had been a quilting room when Ricky Timms uh, was there. And we turned that into a, a three bedroom ladies dorm. And actually Hal turned that into a three bedroom ladies dorm. So um, we really appreciate that. And we, you know, we'll have that memory of him forever. Every time we will walk in that dorm, we'll see his wonderful work. Uh, but today is his memorial service. 
Uh, it will begin at 11.30 Eastern time, uh, which is immediately following this weekly gathering. So please join us for an additional half hour today after the weekly gathering while we remember our beloved friend uh, and chairman, Reverend Hal Seeley. First, I feel to say thank you. Not for anything specific. just for being, just for this experience of existing. To me, there's a difference now between enjoying existing and getting lost in existing. Getting lost in existing is thinking that this existence is reality. Enjoying existing is just that. It's enjoying existing while remembering what's true, what's reality. Any remaining confusion there is between truth and this great joy of existing Help us to see through that confusion. And that doesn't mean we have to stop enjoying existing. It just means that we remember the truth as we do so. Amen. All right, so the next thing that is up on our agenda today is a reading. And Isadora Karcher is going to be my reader today. And she's going to read, um, it's an adaptation from my Seven Steps journal. Uh, most of it is in my journal, but in order to make it flow, I edited it a little as today's reading. So that's why I call it an adaptation, because otherwise it would be kind of choppy. It was written, you know, over a period of years, and <laughs> today we're making it one reading. So, uh, Isadora, I turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Regina. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay, adapted from Regina's Seven Steps Journal. My script unfolds the way it does because of the dreams I've dreamed. I see that my dreams come true. Through loving attention, my dreams come true. I sit here in Colorado looking at the West Peak as evidence that my dreams come true. What else do I want to dream? Or shall I put that same loving attention on my quest for truth? If I can sit here in my own place and look at the West Peak because I dreamed of it, I can awaken. It didn't take long for this West Peak dream to come true. Awakening need not take long either. Dreaming of the West Peak wasn't a burden. It was love. Love will bring me awakening too. It is happy, happy to do so. Do I want to be free from making up my world, my life? Or do I want to make up something new and play some more? The key words in the question above are make up. I can make up more. I can dream more and more dreams will come true. I've done it before, I can do it again. Or I can seek truth genuinely. Aging, 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 and then death. What do I want to do with the time remaining? Be on TV? Oh, geez, no. Quiet awakening. Simple truth beyond my imagination. Let's go for that now. These are interesting words to me. Long dream vision of the world appearance. I have a secret. I know the world is a dream. I know this lifetime is a dream. I know because I have been privy to the power of dream. I have desired and daydreamed and the object of the daydream has manifested. This has happened again and again and again. <clears throat> so much so that I cannot list all of the occurrences of this phenomenon. I've kept it a secret. I haven't told people I wanted, I dreamed of, and then it appeared. 
I haven't told people because I have known something is wrong with this. What's wrong with it? It's dreaming. It's not reality. It's not truth. It hides reality and hides truth. This wisdom, this seeing the fallacy in wanting and getting, has killed all wanting in me because wanting is seen as perpetuating, perpetuating the long dream vision. I'm learning to live now without wanting. It's an adjustment because wanting has been a driving force. Now the driving force is gone and the sense of drifting has taken its place. Empty drifting and a little afraid. Afraid that abandoning wanting is abandoning control of the dream, which is true. I leave the dream to other wanters and we shall see what their wanting does to the dream. I leave it to them because it is theirs now. I abandon dreaming. Quote 1097 from the Seven Steps to Awakening says, one should abandon the false dependence on divine intervention which is in fact the creation of the immature childish mind and with one's intense self-effort, one should gain, ma gain mastery over the mind. Yes, that is what I just said. So this coming up as the next quote now is pure confirmation. One should abandon the false dependence on divine intervention, which is in fact the creation of the immature childish mind. I said it was a secret that I wanted and then it manifested. It's even a greater secret that it manifested as divine intervention taking me by surprise. But it happened over and over and over again until I admit that it was me. And that's how I saw the dream. That's how I saw it had to stop. Wanting, dreaming needs to end in order to reveal what's there when there is no dream. With eyes open and, or eyes closed, being with no thought and ignoring any thought that arises, the only worthy ambition. Quote 1107 in the Seven Steps to Awakening says, the unreal has no existence. To be real is to be uninfluenced existence. If I can stare at pictures, imagine a future and bring it into manifestation, it is influenced and therefore it isn't real. The quote also says, and the real does not cease to be. To realize the real, I do not want to exert any influence. I don't ask the truth to be what I want it to be or what I expect it to be or what I imagine it to be. No more dreams. I simply daydream about no dreams. I want nothing and need nothing and be happy as I look at what is always there and think about what is always here and dream about what is always here. As Nisargadatta Maharaj said, how do you go about finding anything by keeping your mind and heart on it? Interest there must be and steady remembrance. To remember what needs to be remembered is the secret of success. You come to it through earnestness. As Jesus said about the woman who lost a coin, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Quote 1201 from the Seven Steps to Awakening says, by awakening, awakening is attained. Or we could say by sleeping, awakening is avoided. So what do I want now? It is easy to see that the choice is mine. It is easy to see that I am already infinitely unencumbered, infinitely unaffected, infinitely open, infinitely available, and infinite potential. It is easy to see that one surely gains that which for one which one surely gains that for which one strives. It is easy to see that the mind flows along the course of wisdom or of ignorance in whichever direction you make it flow. What do I want now? There is really no question here. I am decided. Thank you, Isadora. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, 
Today's weekly gathering is a little difficult for me. I'll just tell you that right up front because I'm stepping into a territory of teaching that I have not yet stepped into. And every time I take another step forward, I wonder if I will lose some of you all. Uh, but it seems like every time I step forward, I don't. <laughs> That's amazing. Lately, I've been telling people, especially during my Bernadette Roberts and Nizargadatta Maharaj teaching, you guys are amazing that you even sit here and listen to this. But it's important. I mean, we're talking about truth, right? So uh, one of the things that I have discovered for myself is that this world is a dream. I know that we've all read that, um, but I've discovered it for myself. And the way I've discovered it is by dreaming and watching those dreams come true. One after another, after another, after another, after another, so many times that I couldn't even begin to list them all for you. And, and to be honest, I'm even a little bit embarrassed about it. Um, I was telling Jacqueline that the first time I noticed this phenomenon, it's a little silly, <laughs> but I have always loved dogs. And as a, as a young girl, as a little girl, uh, I used to dream about being the queen of the dogs. <laughs> you know how children are, because I love dogs. And when I lived in North Carolina, uh, the, the dogs, and well, I actually lived in New London, which was a very tiny town, one stoplight, and people didn't tie their dogs up unless they were dangerous. Dogs that were, uh, that were not dangerous were not tied up, but most of the dogs would stick to their yard. Well, um, I walked Jamie, you guys all remember Jamie. I walked Jamie every day, uh, about a three mile walk. And what began to happen as we walk around the neighborhood is the neighborhood dogs would get to know us and they would get to know our routine of walking and they would literally start to join us. So we'd walk by one house and a dog would join us and then we'd walk by another house and a dog would join us. And one day I was walking around my neighborhood in North Carolina with, I swear, 20 dogs following me. And I went, oh my God, I'm the queen of the dogs. <laughs> and that was the first time that I noticed uh, that my dreams in one way or another uh, were coming true. Another dream, when I was around uh, 30 years old, I think, I fell in love with this, uh, it was a movie slash television series, you know, one of those brief, one of those movies they play over six weeks or eight weeks, a mini, mini series they called them. Uh, it was East of Eden. And it was a, a wonderful movie written based on the story of Cain and Abel. And I just fell in love with East of Eden. And I thought, you know, I would love, <laughs> I would love to write a, a book uh, that would change people's lives based on the New Testament. Now, of course, I imagined um, that I would write a, a wonderful novel like East of Eden. Uh, and that dream was remembered for a while, for a few years, it was dreamed. I even tried writing a book. I wrote outlines for other books. But then as life went on, eventually that, that dream got put aside. It even got forgotten. And it wasn't even realized the day that I received the guidance to read the New Testament and let the inner voice interpret it for me. It wasn't even realized that was the manifestation of that dream. Uh, I... I followed that guidance, as you know, I read the New Testament, I emptied my mind, this wonderful inner guidance came in, uh, this beautiful book, The Holy Spirit's Interpretation of the New Testament was written, it was published, it was out for some years before one day it hit me like a ton of bricks, oh my God, I dreamed of writing a book based on the New Testament that would change people's lives. Another dream that I used to have was I used to live in San Angelo, Texas, and my brother lived in Aspen, Colorado. And I would go and visit my brother um, about five times a year. You know, just every vacation I got. And of course, when you're in the military, I was in the military then, you get 30 days off a year. So I had plenty of vacation time, and I would go and visit my brother. And every time I would go between San Angelo, Texas and Aspen, Colorado, I would drive up I-25 in Southern Colorado. And as I drove up I-25 in Southern Colorado, I fell in love with Southern Colorado. I even remember telling my, day one day, my dad one day with great passion, this is where I want to live. 
But as years passed, I forgot about that dream too. <laughs> I completely forgot about it. And then one day while I was walking Jamie around um, the neighborhood in North Carolina, I felt this guidance to lay down in the grass. I resisted it because I thought I would fall asleep, but it felt so much like guidance. I went ahead and laid down in the grass and I did fall asleep. And I had this dream that told me to go to Pueblo. I didn't even know where Pueblo was. And when I woke up from the dream, I said, Pueblo with a question mark. And I heard Pueblo, Colorado. And I had no idea where it was. I ran home. I looked it up on the map and I just laughed, still not remembering my previous dream. But I laughed because um, I knew that it was a place that I would love. Shortly after we moved to Pueblo, Colorado, my friend Bill Free was coming to see us and, and he was driving a, a, an RV, like a Winnebago type thing, and it broke down in Trinidad, south of here. And so he asked me to come and get him. So for the first time in many years, about 20 years, I drove down I-25 in Southern Colorado as I drove from Pueblo to Trinidad. And when I drove by the area of Southern Colorado that is um, Greenhorn Mountain and the Spanish Peaks, I remembered. I remembered how much I had wanted to live in this area, and this is where the dream sent me. I mean, I could go on and on and on. You know, before, before the guidance to have a retreat house came, I went down to the Spanish Peaks one day. You know, you can see them from my back porch here in Pueblo. And one day on a Saturday, we had nothing to do. And I said to Ron, why don't we go down there? And pointed at the Spanish Peaks. So we got in the car, went down there, uh, found our way, didn't even know what was there, but found our way to the Cuchara Pass, where many of y'all have been now. And we hiked all the way up, up the West Peak Trail. Um, and from that day forward, I knew I wanted to live there. I wanted to live there. I began looking at realtor.com, looking at cheap little condos, uh, right away because I wanted to live there. And I remember Danielle took it personally because <laughs> Danielle lived here then and she thought that this was my way of saying she, that I couldn't meditate, she was in my way and she ended up moving out. Uh, but her moving out didn't stop me from wanting to be there. Um, I have a whole stack of pictures here that used to be plastered all over my office as I would stare at these pictures and dream of being there. Even when the guidance for the retreat house first came, I didn't, I didn't connect it to this. But then one day we were setting up on the West Peak with um, John Mark Stroud. And John Mark Stroud said, this is, you know, this is where you should have the retreat house. And I knew in that minute, in that minute that we would. You know, now we not only have a retreat house there, but my mom moved there. And I have a house there. I mean, look at all these pictures. I'm not going to keep showing them because there's just so many. Look at them, look at them, look at them. They used to be posted all over my office. I would sit here and stare at pictures. Plus, I checked realtor.com every day and stared at pictures there. And now we have a retreat house in La Vida, and I have a home in La Vida. In fact, my mother's house is actually in my name. It also seems like I can want something. And it comes even faster now. You know, like I, I walked into the mercantile in La Vida and there was this beautiful painting of an angel and I fell in love with it, but I felt it was too expensive for me. It wasn't a couple of weeks later that um, Jacqueline and Jay and Cheryl uh, and Shauna put their money together and bought that for me. And when they handed it to me, although I love it and it's hanging in my bedroom and I love it, when they handed it to me, my thought was, this has got to stop. I've got to quit wanting stuff. I've got to quit. There's this feeling that I'm elongating the dream by wanting stuff and having it happen. You know? In the song that we just listened to, they talked about a million dreams for the world we're going to make a million dreams for the world we're gonna make. And I'm here to tell you that you can, you can make your own dream world. But what people often talk about is creating your own reality. And that's not something you can do. You can only create your own dream. 
you can't create your own reality. There's the difference. And this is why when they handed me that lovely picture of, of Esmeralda, the angel, which is hanging in my bedroom in La Vida, <laughs> that's why I said, this has got to stop. It's got to stop. You either see the dream or you see reality, right? Another thing that was in the song when they were talking about a million dreams for the world we're going to make, they talked about the world that they closed their eyes to see. When we create a dream world, we close our eyes to reality. So one of the things that I've been contemplating deeply here, and I, and I came here to share this with you, and, and part of it I'll repeat, because I know part of this you're like, well, that's not new, but part of this I need to repeat very clearly because it is maybe new to you. And, you know, if you read the teachings of Inner Ramana, Inner Ramana is very clear that we can continue to make the script, make the dream, continue to make the script, or let go of making the script and, and focus on truth. And Ramana is also very clear that the script's going to continue to unfold. You know, like some of these dreams are things I dreamed a long time ago, and they may still happen. You know, I can't make the dreams that I've dreamed in the past stop happening. You know, they're, you could say they're already in motion. So it's not that the dreams are going to quit coming true. It's that I stop investing in dreams, right? I dream about reality, even as my dreams are coming true around me. I dream about noticing what's noticing this unfolding, right? The dreams that I've dreamed that have come true, and again, there's many more than I could sit here and tell you about in this brief amount of time. Every one of them I dreamed about with love. You know, like I loved the dream of living in Southern Colorado. I loved the dream of writing a book based on the New Testament. I loved the dream of having my own place, my own place to meditate, uh, down by the West Peak. It wasn't a burden to dream these dreams. Nobody told me, you have to dream these dreams and then they will come true. This is something that just naturally came from my heart, right? And in fact, sometimes the question even arises, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know the answer to the question. Were they really my dreams, meaning the egos? Or were they consciousness's dreams? You know, like, was I put on the planet Earth to dream these dreams? Because consciousness wanted this. And in fact, one dream I know I was put on the planet Earth to dream because I was told. I was told to, you know, I was given the guidance when I went into the, the St. Clair's Chapel in Santa Barbara, California, and dropped to my knees, and the guidance came in for this retreat house. I was told to start now. And I knew what start now meant. It meant start dreaming. My job was to dream it into manifestation. And here's the dream sheet. House. You know, it has bedrooms and porches and scenery, right? This is the dream sheet that I created that hung here in my office. And I looked at it every day with love. And I knew that was my job. I also knew that I was not to be attached to that dream, or I knew very clearly that I wasn't to get specific. Like my dream was to be kind of like a, a bunch of ingredients that I was throwing together, but it was up to consciousness to determine exactly how those things would get put together and what would really, what specific would come out of it. So I was very clear on my dreaming job. And I even knew when my dreaming was to get more intense now. In fact, I think I told you guys this story. There's a, a Kabbalah story about um, Moses. When Moses was splitting the Red Sea, 
but there was one particular person with him. I think his name was like Necron or Nexron or something like that. Seems like it had the word neck in it. <laughs> and, and what he did was he had so much faith that Moses and God would split the Red Sea that he started walking into the Red Sea, even though it wasn't yet split. And he kept walking and kept walking. And the water, according to the story, was all the way up to here. And he's still walking forward. And then the miracle happened and the Red Sea split. Well, there came this point towards the, you know, maybe this is the last three months before we got the retreat house, where I began to feel like Necron. I think we began to write our policies about the retreat house. I can't remember what all we did, but we began to act as if we already have it. And we didn't. And at that time, the place we were looking at was worth $3 million, you know. Um, and I told the people around me that I felt like Necron, but I needed to keep walking, keep walking, keep walking. And I did. And then the Red Sea split and this house became available to us. Looks very much like Beverly's place. I, every time you're in your place, Beverly, it looks to me like you're at the retreat house. You have the same ceiling, the same color walls. <laughs> So at least in that case, I knew my job was to dream. But what I also knew was I was to dream and not be attached. In fact, two days before we found the retreat house, I got into a conversation with someone who wanted me to dream about a very specific place. And it looked like that place um, needed to be dreamed about now. And I was Necron walking into the, into the water. And that place needed to be dreamed about now because if we didn't dream about it now, it was going to be lost. Someone else was going to buy it. And I told her I couldn't do that. I knew I couldn't do that. Even though it was my guidance to dream about the retreat house, it was my guidance to bring the retreat house into manifestation through dreaming. I could not put my dream on a specific outcome. And in fact, I said, the way that I have to dream is I have to dream being completely okay if we never get a retreat house. That's how unattached the dreaming has to be. I think that's a balance a lot of people can't find maybe. And I remember when I said, said that, she kind of, she gasped almost. And she, in fact, I think she um, said something like I had thrown down my staff. I was no longer Necron or Moses. I had thrown down my staff. Two days later, we, the retreat house showed up. One more thing I want to say before I circle around and summarize. A lot of my dreams, even though I did not in any way feel like I was dreaming them from guidance, this dream for the retreat house, I felt like it was my guidance to dream about it, right? But there were a lot of dreams I had when I was younger that I did not feel were my guidance to dream about. Just something touched my heart, like I wanna write a book based on the New Testament that will change people's lives, or I wanna live in this area of Colorado. And it just touched my heart immediately and I naturally began to dream. And later, much later, after those dreams had even been forgotten about, they manifested, but they manifested as guidance you know like with all sincerity and not an ounce of of deception i told you all that one day i heard guidance completely unexpected to to grab the new testament and read it and allow the inner voice to interpret it for me and i told you honestly without an ounce of deception that i was guided to lay down in the grass and i had this dream that told me to go to pueblo and it even said Pueblo, Colorado, after my eyes were opened. There wasn't anything in those stories that aren't true. And this is one of the things that really sobered me up to the fact that this is a dream. Because I came to realize that even the right mind, or as we might sometimes say, even consciousness, is the dream. Now, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't follow guidance because you should. You have two choices. You follow ego or you, you follow guidance. And the ego is going to keep you trapped in the dream and keep you suffering. 
and the guidance is going to wake you up from the dream. But it is the dream manifesting. It's just the dream manifesting pointing out of the dream. One of these um one of these quotes from Seven Steps to Awakening. Let me go back and find the reading and read this quote to you again. And, and you have to listen to me very, very carefully so that your confused mind does not jump in here. Uh, this quote says, this is quote 1097. One should abandon the false dependence on divine intervention. I'll read that again. One should abandon the false dependence on divine intervention, which is in fact the creation of the immature childish mind. And with one's intense self-effort should gain mastery over the mind. So what is that saying? Stop following guidance? Not the way I hear it. It's, you still have to follow something. And you're either following the right mind or the wrong mind, right? As a person, you have to follow something. But when I hear that stop your dependence on, to me, that means stop seeing that as reality. Stop taking your guidance, move to Pueblo, write a book on the New Testament, you know, the scribing of A Course in Miracles, the splitting of the Red Sea. Stop seeing that as reality. That's still dream. It doesn't mean you don't follow the guidance. It doesn't mean you don't walk across the Red Sea when it splits. It means be clear that this is the dream that leads out of the dream. And don't confuse it with reality. If you keep your mind and your heart set on reality, then even as you're moving through the dream, and we call this being in the world but not of it, even as you're moving through the dream, your focus is reality. And the power of that focus will wake you up. But if you get too caught up on, let's start with worldly dreams. If you get too caught up on, I want to live here one day. I want to have a beautiful house by the lake one day. You know, I want to be whatever one day. I want this one day. If you're too caught up in the world, then, you're, then you have your eyes closed and you're making a dream. But even at the next level, if you take the spiritual guidance that is leading you out of the dream and, and mistake it for the truth, you know, like a lot of people who study A Course in Miracles mistake A Course in Miracles for the truth. It's not. It's a, it's a dream manifestation that is pointing out of the dream. But if you stop there and you say, this is the truth, you're still in the dream. Let's see, let me, let me read to you from NTI because this is so clear. And I've read this to you so many times, so it must be one of my favorite parts of NTI. It's NTI Revelation chapter one. The world is an illusion. And so, Everything you experience as you let go of the world is illusion also. And then in italics it says, you are not to believe any of it. But helpful symbols will be given to guide you. Remember that they are only symbols. Follow them, realizing you know not where they lead. You see, that's not saying don't follow the guidance because it's just a dream. It says follow the guidance and remember it's just a dream, <laughs> right? It's both. Don't mistake it for the truth. 
Remember that they are only symbols. Follow them, realizing you know not where they lead. Do not idolize anything within the world or any symbol or any thought that is sent to lead you from the world. Hold to them as they are useful, but let them go when their usefulness has passed. You are to keep moving by letting go until you find yourself with nothing left to hold on to. No dreams, not even the dream of awakening. That's the last dream to go. Recently in my seven steps journal, I wrote about the immature, the mature, and the advanced mature, <laughs> advanced maturity, I called it. Immature, mature, and advanced maturity. And the immature would be those that are dreaming about the world. Right. Okay. Now that I'm in La Vida, I want, you know, my next dream, whatever my next dream is. Right. That's the immature. They, and every dream, when it, when it, when it's realized, it has to be replaced by another dream for the immature. There cannot be a state of not dreaming because this is a dream. Right. The dream will not allow the immature to have a state of not dreaming. So every dream or every desire, once satisfied, is very quickly replaced with another one because this is a dream and dreaming is what it's all about. Now the mature are beginning to have some realization of this and this realization that as long as you dream, the script just keeps being made. Through your dreams, you're literally writing the script. And that as long as you continue to get caught up in these dreams, when they come to you from consciousness, maybe from the part of consciousness that still wants to dream. But when they come to you, if you latch on to them and you keep dreaming, the dream just keeps getting written. Your co-creator is the term that is often used, right? You're co-writing the script. So the mature realize this and they realize that if they want to awaken from the dream, they need to focus on one desire, one dream. And that one dream is awakening from the dream. And that's what the mature do. The mature focus on one dream. And they focus on it with the same intensity and the same love as maybe when they were a little girl looking at bride magazines and dreaming of growing up and getting married, right? Or maybe when they were a little boy and they dreamed of playing sports with great skill, right? Nobody made you dream those dreams. It came from love. And that's why in whatever way it manifested, it manifested because you loved it so dearly. So the mature understand the power of dreaming, but now they employ that power towards one desire only. And it's kind of a funny way to dream because you don't really know what the truth is, right? So you're, you're dreaming about something you can't make, something you can't make up, something you can't imagine, but you dream of it anyway. And this is how you know that you aren't creating more dream because this is a dream that has no images. There are no pictures to stare at, right? But the way that you dream it, I think, is through a spiritual practice, you know, through the times that you spend in meditation, the times that you spend in contemplation, the times that you spend paying awareness games. That is the activity of this type of dreaming. And then those with advanced maturity are those who have realized reality. And so even that dream is gone. So why am I here? I'm here to make sure we're clear on the difference between truth and non-truth. And also to realize that the, the same tools, the same dreaming that continues the dream can be used to walk us back out of the dream, used properly. 
And then beyond that, each one needs to make their own choice what they'll do with their dreaming. All right, so uh, this is the part of our weekly gathering where you all get to share. Thank you, Don, I saw your message. That's nice to know. This is the part of the weekly gathering where you all get to share based on today's reading and homily. So who would like to share? Jay, I was guessing you and I saw you walk across the room. Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, one of the things I noticed in myself is I really start to let go. This could happen in meditation or just contemplating out by the lake or wherever. Um, as I'm moving to letting go, letting go, what the mind will do is will put in a spiritual image of me as a some kind of a spiritual experience or something that I'd be having. You know what I mean? Like uh, it finds like as you let go of worldly things or things you may want, um, there's still that spiritual desire, right? And um, I notice that my mind will put in an image of me walking on water or something or something like that to try to keep me in mind. You know, so I kind of notice that occur. Um, I'm not distracted a lot by worldly things too much anymore, but it's, I noticed that occur like these images of spiritual sort of dreams, quote unquote, coming into my mind sometimes. Thank you. And Carla? Sometimes I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. So, I, it's really interesting. I've been, I've been feeling guidance to connect with you, Regina, but I've been hesitating. And then I'm hearing, so you're, so I don't have to do it. So here I'm getting it in this sharing today. And I think I might need to listen to it again because I don't understand all of it. I'm still um, attached to the dream that um, I kind of this might go on, but I've lived in this house for over 25 years. I prepared for my old age. I I put a 50 year roof on it longer than I'm probably going to live. Maybe, maybe I have done all I've done, done new vinyl windows and I've insulated it twice. And I have a new furnace and I have air conditioning. I've all, done all this. I painted the whole house. <laughs> I've done all these things to prepare for it. And now I feel guided to leave the house. So let go of everything I was, attached to right and it's it's really stirring up <sighs> a lot of fear i know that's not me it's ego reacting to my decision to leave and and i don't know what's going to happen and what i'm realizing i've been thinking like Oh, this is going to be hard. Oh, this is going to be a lot of stuff I'm going to let go of. Oh, this is going to be... Oh, Allah is making up this dream. Realizing, talking to you, listening to you, is that what I've been making up that... I don't... Not be attached to... Just allow it to unfold. I don't have to really decide what it is, but what I'm getting to is this. That I feel guided. This is really, I oh, really, it's really hard for me to share this. Oh man, it seems like a big, huge story that um, you guys doesn't really want me to share it, but I'm going to in this group. That I've been feel guided to move to Mexico. And I have a connection with a Hispanic dude, and he's going to support me because I was told that, are you willing to stay here? Like two years ago, are you willing to stay here where it's all comfortable and you're familiar and you're gut? Or are you willing to become something 
more. I'm using words now. It wasn't words today. I'm like, my eyes probably became big like saucers. I said, I am willing. And I would like some support. And this is David. And oh, I don't want to even share this. But it feels like my script is to, I'm not really guided to share the whole specifics, but to have an impact on this culture, which I don't know anything about. I don't even know how to speak Spanish. And, um, it's so so what I'm listening to is is how do I do that yet let go of the attachment of that? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea how. And I guess that's the learning I'm gonna I'm 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 embracing. I'm gonna learn how. But I don't know how now. I don't even know what that looks like. And I feel a sadness coming up. I know it's not, it's not even real. It's not even true. It's just ego trying to get my attention. This is sad. But this is actually a very joyous occasion. Because I, I'm willing, I'm willing to embrace the unknown. And I don't have to know, I, I, I use poor words probably, but I don't need to know how my awakening is going to unfold. I just step into it. So, I guess I got to listen to myself again, too, because I don't know what I just shared, but I don't feel that, I don't know there's a culmination, but I just need to let go, let go, let go. When I had, I when I was in Kuwait the first time, I said, the first prayer I probably said, I didn't realize it was a prayer. So it's like, I don't know if you're out there, angels, but if you are, I could use some help. And then my life changed, and it's still changing. The dream is still unfolding. And I wasn't willing, and I said I was open and willing, and I wasn't. And I was because it's unfolding. So I had, a, had, a, had a vision here of an idea to share, but it's gone now. And maybe that's okay too. It's acceptance of everything. Just the acceptance of self, of everything, everything. So, I'm just going to stop there. I don't know where I went and what, what I even said. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And one of the things that you said, which I'll bring back to your consciousness, was that you needed to learn how to follow this guidance of going to Mexico without being attached. And one of the ways you can do that, of course, is by going within, you know, each day and being guided from the inner voice so that the head doesn't take over. So thank you for sharing. Is there anyone else who wants to share? I guess briefly, because <laughs> it's almost time for the memorial service. Many times was not on a spiritual path and just loved bluegrass. But even that song has manifested, you know, where I have all these wonderful blessings that I receive. And it's that time in the morning, that presence with God, that's my favorite gift of all. Of all. You just, every, any, whatever we focus on with love will come to be. I mean, that's the case. So again, 
Uh, and I see Lisa's here and I see, I guess that's Mary. Is that you, Mary, over there with Hal Seeley's name? Um, it's good to see you all here for the memorial service. I'm gonna release the mic and let Don bring us into it, but then I will be back in a moment. Thank you for watching. This was our weekly gathering that we hold online. For more information, you can visit our website at awakening-together.org or you can subscribe to our Awakening Together channel and click the bell for more notifications when we post our weekly gatherings. Thank you again for watching.